Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's my great pleasure to be here today. Thank you for the invite to this first co-eco symposium. And my talk is going to be on response of coastal wetlands to climate change at the southern tip of Africa. And um, the particular coastal wetlands I will be addressing is salt marsh, mangroves and sea grasses. In South Africa, our coastline is divided into three biogeographic regions. That's from the subtropical on the east coast down to the warm temperate up to the cool temperate on the west coast. And this is driven by the dominant currents, the warmer Gullis current and the cold Benguela current. Because of the high energy nature of the coast, coastal wetlands are situated in our estuaries and we have 290 estuaries along our 3000 kilometer coast. These systems are wave dominated, they're microtidal, they're small and shallow. And another characteristic feature is that they're close to the sea. More than 75% of our estuaries at some time seasonally or depending on rainfall, a sandbar will form at the mouth and the estuary will close to the sea. Looking at mangrove distribution for the coastline, these obviously only occur along the east coast in the subtropical to warm temperate zone and we have a small tropical area up near Cozy Bay. The distribution of the mangroves is quite dynamic and the names of the estuaries in red are those where we've recorded losses, whereas the names in green are those where we have recorded gains in mangrove area. Most of the mangroves occur in the permanently open estuaries, but they can also occur in those that close to the sea. Salt marsh occurs along an inundation gradient from the sea grass in the lower reaches up to intertidal salt marsh occurring from 0.7 to 1.5 meters above mean sea level and then to supratidal salt marsh, which is greater than 1.5 meters above mean sea level. Salt marsh occurs in all of our estuaries around the coast. So for example, 11 out of the 16 estuaries in the cool temperate region, half, almost half of the estuaries in the warm temperate region. But as we go into the subtropical region, uh, rainfall increases and salt marsh habitat is replaced by reeds and sedges in closed estuaries and in open intertidal estuaries it is replaced by mangroves. Looking at the distribution of seagrass, our dominant seagrass in our estuaries is Zostra capensis. It is an endangered species. It occurs in estuaries from the west coast all the way up to the east coast. And we have an important project, Project um, Sea Store with the University of Stellenbosch, looking at climate change and genetic responses of the seagrass around our coast. So we've got a very interesting laboratory, an outdoor laboratory to look at climate change and range expansion. And what we find is an expansion of cool temperate taxa and an expansion of subtropical taxa so that there's actually a current squeeze on our warm temperate taxa. If we look now at some of the predicted climate change responses for the country, um, South Africa is going to increase in temperature. It will become warmer and drier, and that is from two to four degrees Celsius, an increase is predicted for the mid to far future. As a result of this, we expect some range expansion of the more subtropical species, in particular the mangroves. And we have recorded expansion in some of our systems, such as the Nahoon estuary here, where mangroves are increasing in area by 0.6 hectare per annum. We also predict a change in rainfall patterns. The summer rainfall region on the east coast will become wetter during summer with more intense extreme rainfall. So when there are rainfall events, it's going to be a more extreme event. And the drier winter rainfall region is predicted to become drier. 
So can we see any influence of this yet on our coastal wetlands? We find for the salt marsh that salinization and desiccation is already occurring. And in the large salt marshes of the west coast, the systems are becoming more patchy. So if we look at area cover, we still have the area cover of the salt marsh, but there's definitely a loss of connectivity in some areas. In the estuaries that are close to the sea, because of drought, lower freshwater inflow, these systems now close more frequently to the sea or for longer periods of time. And if there is still some rainfall, water level increases and the salt marsh habitats become flooded. Some of the plants can survive this, such as seen here, the Salicornia tegetaria, where it grows above the water. And even here it's seen flowering because changes in water level and inundation can influence the phenology of the plant. And we've done some research on that. So droughts leading to drying and a more saline conditions, but a different response in our closed estuaries where the mouth closes and the coastal wetlands actually become inundated. What is the effect of mouth closure on the mangroves? The dominant species here in this estuary is Avicennia marina. It has pneumatophores, and when the water level increased in this estuary, you can see the water level mark up at this top right photograph. The pneumatophores in the trees were flooded, and they died back after three months. Interesting for that system, when the mouth then did open to the sea, the mangrove establishment has been slow. And instead, that degraded open habitat has now been covered by succulent salt marsh species. Increased runoff, as we said, there will be an increase in the intensity of rainfall. What this does is flush off the catchments, bringing in very large nutrient loads from developed catchments and resulting in eutrophication. In South Africa's estuaries, we now have fish kills recorded for about 10% of all our estuaries. We have large macroalgal blooms that outcompete submerged macrophytes, and we have large microalgal blooms, such as that seen here with the harmful algal bloom species, Heterosigma akishinwa. We also have floating aquatic macrophytes occurring, such as the common water hyacinth, which is an invasive alien aquatic species occurring often with a number of other species, such as a Zola parrot's feather. When the estuary is close to the sea and the salinity is very low, um, and if it's in a developed catchment or there's a wastewater treatment works there, we find that the entire estuary can be covered by these aquatic invasive species. With climate change, there's going to be an increase in the intensity of freshwater flooding. And along our east coast, we've been monitoring the distribution and occurrence of mangroves since 1988. And so for some of the smaller estuaries where we see just a small area of mangroves, this would be in hectares, mangrove cover, we see that there's been dynamic changes. Floods will come out and completely flush out the mangrove areas. These will re-establish and that rate of re-establishment becomes important. So if there's an intense if there's an increase in the intensity of floods and if they happen more frequently, then we can expect more dynamic changes in our small mangrove systems. We're also looking at sea level rise and the effect on our coastal wetlands. We're assessing the vulnerability of coastal habitats to sea level rise so that mitigation plans can be developed. And we've set up our set rod surface elevation tables, the Cahoon method, in a number of our estuaries, some with salt marshes and some with mangrove systems. Our data from this has found global significance. We have some records of over 10 years and it's been incorporated in articles such as this Nature article by Professor Kerry Lee Rogers. This looked at wetland carbon storage uh, and uh, variation in relation to relative sea level rise. When we go down onto an individual estuary level, we find that for different sites, is the erosion or deposition occurring? Are our wetlands keeping pace with sea level rise? We find that within an estuary, this can be quite dynamic. So looking at this bottom plot, for the lower reaches in this estuary, there was some accumulation of sediment, whereas in the middle reaches, 
that would be sites three and four in the middle reaches of this estuary, it's very tidal and erosion is taking place. Whereas in the upper reaches, there is deposition of sediment. So within a system, um, accretion and erosion is quite a dynamic process. We found a similar pattern here for the Swatkops estuary. And here uh, we had the RSET data from 2008 up until 2020, just looking at a 10 year average. Once again, different responses for different areas of the estuary. Some deposition happening, some erosion happening. We're also looking at coastal squeeze, and this is particularly important because for the lateral expansion of the coastal wetlands, in some areas there is available habitat for salt marsh to expand to. But in many of our coastal estuaries, there's obviously development right on the edge of these systems. And so, for example, in this estuary, it is actually a protected area. It's um, managed by our South African national parks. And so we did a study here to identify for them areas that should now be protective and conserved to allow for future salt marsh migration. And it's because with sea level rise, the salt marsh habitats will be flooded and they will need to move further inland in order to survive. We're starting to have a look at sea storms, although the data are quite complicated. So the, uh, overall for South Africa, a 10% increase in wind speed is expected. This can result in a 26% increase in wave height and generating up to an 80% increase in wave power. And we have been noticing some erosion taking place of our salt marsh habitats. And this was a small study we did on one of our local estuaries with pictures shown here on the right where the, a lot of erosion started to occur after 2013. And when we went back and looked at the various abiotic drivers, it was wind in particular that the year prior to this, there'd been an increase in the number of gale force wind days. And just one extreme event such as this can lead and start salt marsh erosion, which then can continue quite rapidly. Sea storms and an increase in wave height can also lead to sediment deposition, which can have an influence on mangrove habitats. So in this particular estuary, there was a sea storm event and marine sediment was deposited in the estuary in the lower reaches, uh, deposited on top of the mangrove stands, which led to smothering of the pneumatophores of Abyssinia marina. And once again in this system, when the mangroves died back, they were replaced by succulent salt marsh. So we can expect an increase in the intensity of these events in the future. So to summarize some of the expected changes, we're going to have climate and hydrological change, warming and higher aridity. And as I've shown, we're already seeing examples of salinization and drying. Increased droughts can lead to an increase in salinity and in our closed estuaries in an increase in closed mouth condition. Increased floods leads to an increase in scouring, and we've got data to show that this can scour out entire mangrove areas. With increased floods, particularly in developed catchments, nutrient inputs and eutrophication is already a great pressure in our estuaries. Sea level rise and increased storminess is changing inundation and waterlogging patterns. We have a good understanding from the ecophysiological responses of the mangroves and salt marshes what they are going to do in response to these dynamic changes. And we're only starting now to measure erosion and deposition. As I said, we've got some 10 year data sets on our set. We might even have with sea level rise an increase in open mouth conditions in some of our East Coast estuaries. And we will be going this year to once again check on the mangrove area cover and what the mangroves are doing along our coast. So we have a long term monitoring on the East Coast checking out the mangroves every 10 years to see what dynamic changes have occurred. Increased CO2 will increase plant growth and productivity. And this is where we expect to find an expansion of mangroves into salt marsh and therefore long term monitoring records are needed for our coastline. So we know that with climate change, systems will become less stable. This will influence propagil dispersal, seedling establishment and survival. And so we're using mangrove propagule dispersal and recruitment models to predict movement patterns. 
We also know that this is influenced by local coastal hydrology and the geomorphology of our estuaries, and so this is included in our modelling approaches. And from this research, we hope to improve our data sets and contribute to the knowledge on the long-term dynamics of mangroves, particularly in a climate change transition zone, and our mangroves in South Africa are one of the most heavily distributed in the world. The currents are going to influence patterns. So we have the meandering agalis current, which is causing an increase in shelf upwelling. This year there was a very um, cold spell and there was a lot of ocean changes which had an influence on the coast. There was upwelling and a sudden drop in temperature by 10 degrees that caused massive fish kills along our coast. This happened in the beginning of this year. So we are noting these dynamic changes uh, increasing in frequency. Um, so that's some of our research on climate change. We're trying to link abiotic change, sea level rise, sea storms, floods, changes in temperatures, droughts and CO2 with inundation patterns, water logging patterns. We need to look at estuary mouth state sediment supply and eutrophication, as well as sediment biogeochemistry, moisture and salinity. This is then translated into an understanding of ecological processes and attributes, such as sediment compaction, landward migration, what are the effect on species and habitat diversity, and how are we, um, what predicted changes do we expect to find in mangrove expansion and distributional shifts such as changes in um, phenology. We do find an increase in invasive species and particularly combined with eutrophication and an increase in temperatures, a future threat is the invasive aquatic macrophyte species in our estuaries. And we're translating these changes then into what does this mean for ecosystem service provision? So our ongoing research is looking at climate change mitigation and adaptation strategies for South African estuarine lakes. The estuarine lakes have large surface area and retention time, and they're particularly sensitive. Their responses occur on decadal patterns. We have decadal patterns of droughts and floods in these systems. And so we have this new research project that's trying to um, capture our understanding here. We have another project that's providing input to both national and international policy, and that's a blue carbon sink study that's ongoing, led by Dr. Jackie Raw. Here we're developing a greenhouse gas emissions and removal baseline for our blue carbon ecosystems and identifying climate change mitigation actions. We've also started a large research program on restoration ecosystem restoration to deliver multiple ecosystem services. In particular, we're looking at innovative methods for estuary water quality improvement. This includes a variety of different disciplines, scientists and researchers, as we need to look at things such as artificial wetlands and other innovative approaches. We're looking at restoration of estuarine habitats for carbon offsetting and other provision of ecosystem services. And we're doing starting some experimental ecosystem accounting working with Stat South Africa. And this is, will particularly in the future be used to track change in terms of what significance and impact is our restoration activities having. And this research is aligned with the UN decade on ocean science as well as the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. With all of our endeavours, whether it's management, uh, implementation of our research, we work very closely uh, with a number of different government departments across the science policy practice continuum. And certainly climate change has now become a catalyst for sustainable management. And therefore, both with our research and with implementation of management actions, we're looking at a socio-ecological systems approach. And particularly if we put restoration in this framework, we're looking at a strategic adaptive management framework. We would set a restoration goal, identify clear management actions, implementation and monitoring. This then we can look at estuary state and within an estuary, we could go down into the abiotic and the biotic health state in terms of species richness, abundance and community composition. 
that would capture the responses of the coastal wetlands and then relating it to ecosystem service provision. So some of our research is looking at the estuary as a filter, what role our wetlands are playing in carbon storage. We know very little about our wetlands for coastal buffers and bank protection. We have quite a bit of research going on with our coastal wetlands as fish nursery habitats. And so we're working with social scientists to link all of this understanding and knowledge with the state of the societal system, looking at human well-being, human benefits, whether they're social, economic and personal, and the value of the system. And all of this is brought together by governance in a system where you regulate, moderate and reconcile diverse uses. We're providing input on a daily basis to estuary and coastal wetland management. And it's this that we're trying to achieve, a socio-ecological systems approach. Thank you. I hope that's given you a brief overview of some of our research and some of our findings on the response of coastal wetlands to climate change at the southern tip of Africa.